Hi folks, my name is Jeff Cox and I'm an engineering director at Google in charge of the build test release organization. And I'm here to talk to you about the state of Bazel. First, I wanna welcome you to BaselCon 2020, uh, acknowledging that we are definitely in a unique time in the world and uh, we've obviously had to conduct a virtual conference uh, as opposed to a physical conference this time. I'm still really excited about the amount of material we have and the interactive sessions we're gonna have. And I'm really happy that you are all participating. And I think it'll be a great conference. I wanna remind you that like every single past BaselCon conference, we have a code of conduct that's published on our BaselCon website. For social media posts, please use the hashtag uh, or the BaselCon hashtag on Twitter. And for attendee networking, please join, join the hashtag BaselCon 2020 channel on the Basil Slack site to chat with other attendees and use the hashtag BaselCon 2020 announcements for official announcements. So I want to start off this talk by giving you a bit of Basil history. I've been a part of the Basil journey since its start. I actually started managing the build tools team at Google back in 2010. And it was in 2014 that we as an organization decided that we were going to open source Bazel. And to really give context for Bazel and its path, it's important to go back and understand some of Google's key development principles, which have been around since the start of the business. So these aren't all of them, but there's some ones that are particularly relevant to building and testing software. So first, as many of you already know, Google uses what we call a mono repo or a single code repository for all of its code. Google practices building all of its applications from source. So we never use checked in binaries or libraries for a variety of reasons, um, mostly around compatibility. We practice continuous integration. So rather than having long lived feature branches, all developers are continuously vetting their code and checking it into head. So we're all working at the same cut of the, re of the repository. And I think perhaps most significantly is that in this environment, everybody should be able to edit, build, and test just about everything. And the result in our view is improved productivity across the business. So much so that we wrote a book about it the software engineering book, which has chapters both on our continuous integration approach and on our build approach. So those are just the principles, but we need tooling to support those principles. One key tool that Google developed starting back in 2005 or 2006 was an application called Blaze, which is a single build system for this entire massive code repository that is polyglot. It can be used to build arbitrary languages, Python, Go, Java, JavaScript, TypeScript, Android apps, iOS apps. Uh, it is designed to be correct so that when you give it the same inputs, it generates the same outputs. And these two characteristics make it very straightforward for a developer in the business to easily take a dependency on a shared library to make code sharing easy. And it also means that as we're all building and testing common code and applications, we get the same results with the same code and there's no, it worked on my machine uh, phenomenon. With a huge repo all built from source, with practicing CI, builds get big and there are a lot of them. So we want a system that can do these builds as quickly as possible and reuse the results as much as possible, which is why Blaze is built to be fast through both caching and parallelism. So that's Blaze and Bazel is based on Blaze. So then the question is, if we have this great internal tool that Googlers are using, why did we decide to create Bazel? And that question has multiple answers. One of which is why did we pick the name? And there's a whole backstory on the Bazel name. It took us months to come up with a name for Blaze externally. Blaze itself was rejected pretty early for non-technical reasons, really around reuse. And so the team went through a long and arduous exercise to brainstorm, propose, and have rejected countless suggestions for the name. One engineer, one engineer on the team became so frustrated with the process that he just suggested the name Potato, thinking that, well, at least it's a noun and probably wouldn't be taken by some other projects. Uh, fortunately, we decided that having to type 
potato build every single time a developer wanted to run a build was not really a good option. And we ended up on a name that was a rearrangement of the letters of place. But the question I think has a more significant answer as well. Like why did Google decide to share this proprietary implementation that it was using for itself for its own success? And that question has a number of different answers. One is that Google is increasingly investing in open source software. So we're not just developing all of our software in-house. We also have major projects like TensorFlow or Envoy or gRPC, where the internal development stack we have, including Blaze, aren't available. And so externalizing Blaze as Bazel allows our build stack to be used by these open source projects and by third party con uh, contributors to those projects. Another important point is by externalizing Blaze as Bazel, we're validating in the market, so to speak, the value of our tool. Inside of Google, where there is one build tool or one CI solution or one code review solution, we can make these tools work great together and really advance them, but developers inside don't really have a choice. Like they have to use these tools. And so it's harder for us to know through developer choice how great they are. And by externalizing our technology, we're able to get a better signal as to whether there's actual value because outside of Google, developers can make choices about what tools that they use. And finally, equally significantly, by open sourcing Blaze's Babel, we're make, Bazel, we're making an important contribution to the software developer community and also enabling the community to contribute back to Google so that we can all benefit in a, in a um, symbiotic way, whether that's through the community contributing directly to Bazel itself or to the increasing uh, ecosystem that grows around Bazel in terms of rules and plugins, documentation, best practices, et cetera. So what's a really powerful metaphor, I think, is, is to think of Google as a, as a technology island where what's important is that we build, we can innovate on this island, but we need to build bridges to other islands where we can then use those bridges to bring technology out to the benefit of others, but also bring innovations outside into Google as well. Of course, we couldn't just take Blaze and then just copy paste it outside as Bazel. We've had to adapt Blaze to the open world. And we've done that through a number of important innovations in the product. One through Starlark, our rule uh, extension or our extension mechanism for both rules and macros. Two is by allowing, unlike Google, where we don't use external dependency support, we offer the support for teams and companies outside that want to be able to pull in external artifacts into their build. And finally, we've invested heavily in support for an open remote execution protocol that allows outside developers to plug in any number of, a, of any of the increasing number of open source and proprietary remote execution solutions. Crucially, however, though, Bazel is very much not a fork of Blaze. The two implementations continue to co-evolve and share the large majority of their implementation. Today, Bazel is used by a growing number of open source projects by enterprises that really depend on Bazel for the success of their business, just as Google does. We continue to invest significant amount of uh, engineering effort in, in the product from Google and really want to reaffirm our commitment to user success of Bazel itself. We have a lot of work that we're proud of that we've done over the past year, uh, especially given the complexity of 2020. One is that we have successfully enabled community rule ownership of the, both the Python rules and uh, rules Apple. We've delivered an ARM 64 port of Bazel for use on ARM platforms. We've made some pretty major improvements to technical debt through code cleanups, such as the separation of the Java Starlark Net Library. We have significantly improved tools for Starlark development and remote execution, Starlark rules development and remote execution profiling. And we've invested heavily in improved performance of, of Bazel itself, for example, query support. We also have to acknowledge that there's some things that we didn't do as well as we would have liked. As the project has grown and more and more users use it, we've accumulated a backlog of pull requests and GitHub issues. And this is something that we really want to do a better job in addressing next year. 
similarly, we have to acknowledge that our roadmap has not been as up to date uh, and real as we would have liked. So it's been harder for our external community to know where Basil is headed. And we're really doubling down on this for next year uh, as well. And finally, uh, though we were very aspirational in terms of the Basel Federation, this also didn't go as well as we would have liked. And we're going to reboot this going into next year as well. And there'll be more information shared about this in, during the conference. So I also want to spend some time during this keynote talking to you about where Basel is going, uh, its roadmap. And to do that, I want to anchor back to the vision of Basel. Our vision for Basel has been very stable throughout the lifetime of the project. This has been text that's been on our website for years. And a core part of the vision is that any software developer can efficiently build, test, and package any project of any size or complexity with tooling that's easy to adopt and extend. And I really want to emphasize the extend point because I firmly believe that the success of Basil in the future and its growth is going to hinge on our ability to evolve Basil into a platform. And so the Basil team at Google is really going to be focusing on the future of making Basil a great platform and a great development experience for rule owners and developers. That will be accomplished through a number of improvements to Basil and its ecosystem. For one, we really want to improve the Starlock Rules API, develop best practices for rule authors, revamp our external depth support to make it a lot more usable for developers. We want to Starlarkify, if I can use that word, all of the native rules, which ensure that Starlark is a fully capable mechanism for arbitrary uh, rule extensions. And we aren't kind of cheating by programming against native Java APIs inside of Bazel. And finally, we, we are investing a lot more in improved remote execution support, which is a we've identified as a critical need for Bazel customers. Beyond that, we have a lot of other exciting things that we're delivering for our, our customer base based on customer feedback. One really important thing to highlight is that we are developing a long-term support model for Bazel and Bazel releases. So we've gotten feedback from customers that even with a three-month window uh, support window for releases, it's been difficult for, for major projects and enterprises to keep up with our, our rate of, of release delivery. It's also been hard for us to communicate the value of new releases via the version number itself. So going forward, and there'll be uh, a blog post about this soon in our blog, we're going to start re releasing LTS releases with longer support windows starting in December. And we will also maintain continuous rolling releases that are built against the most current version of the Bazel code base for users that want to stay closer to the, to the front and make use of features as they become available soon. Another thing I'm really excited to talk about and share with all of you, and this is something we've spent a lot of time working on over the past few years, is that we are now implementing support for building the Android open source platform with Bazel. Uh, working in collaboration with the Android organization inside Google, as well as key Android partners. This will bring all the benefits of both Bazel as a build tool, correct fast, as well as the growing ecosystem of, of Bazel technologies, plugins, documentation to developers of the Android platform. This, I think, also helps to communicate to all of you how much Google really uh, continues to invest in Bazel and Bazel's success and is increasingly depending on Bazel for, for its own development success, not just inside Google, but also outside. We also are really excited to be able to pre-announce the eventual availability of a Debian package for Bazel. This was actually rooted in the COVID pandemic, which created demand for TensorFlow to be able to, na to be natively available in Debian to support scientists working on the problem. And therefore, we want to get enough of Bazel bootstrapped into Debian so that you can build TensorFlow. So it'll solve the TensorFlow need, but also then be directly available at, in Debian for Debian users. So I want to close with some logistical bits about the conference. So we're going to have both a live Q&A and a bird of a feather set of sessions. And for both of these, if you've expressed interest during the registration and were among the first 100 attendees to express interest, 
you should be in possession of a calendar invite with a Google Meet code to join that particular session, each moderated by Bazel team members. Please join in at the time specified on the calendar invite to participate. You will also be receiving a feedback form after the events. Your feedback is very important to us and will help shape both the format and content of future iterations of BaselCon. If you have a moment to leave feedback, we would greatly appreciate it. I know for a fact that the feedback we've received previously in previous conferences has heavily influenced how we've set up and run past sessions or past conferences, as well as BaselCon 2020. So I wanna close by thanking all of you for, for being here, for participating, for being a, a part of our, our growing community uh, and to making BaselCon a success. I wanna thank especially our presenters who I believe went above and beyond to make this virtual conference setting effective and work. And, and we'll be delivering a lot of both very interesting and informative material to all of you. So thanks, enjoy BaselCon 2020, and I will see you at the Q&A.